a nice uh, 530 service and was well attended and we uh, our service tonight is almost just like that one except that we have with us a guest playing the organ tonight Leslie Light and we're welcoming him to be with us AJ is going to lead the singing and so I'm going to get us started simply by doing the Advent wreath and we're going to light the Christ candle the center candle We've been doing this for now since four weeks. We're going to finally get to light this candle. This signifies the coming of Christ, which we know is happening at least symbolically tonight. As you're able, would you stand as we do this? And we're going to sing one verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, as soon as I finish reading. Which verse? Huh? Uh, it's the uh, verse that, uh, it's, got, it's whichever one's going to be on the screen, AJ. Eh, <laughs> That's all I can tell you. I don't know. Christ came to bring us salvation and has promised to come again. Let us pray that we may always be ready to welcome him. reading comes from the Gospel of Luke in the second chapter. It's the first few verses. <laughs> it's okay. Oh, uh, you know, you pray. All right, talk by quietly among yourselves. Now, you should be. Okay, here we go. In those days, a decree went out from the Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee and Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn.
Again from the Gospel of Luke. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace among those who meet favors. Sing away in a manger, would you please stand if you're able as we sing?
And you may be seated. I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward at this time for the collection of our gifts, tithes, and offerings. <coughs> Let us pray. Gracious God, as we gather on this joyous occasion of the birth of Christ, we're reminded of how blessed we are and how much need there is for the risen Christ in this community. So today as we gather, we ask you to accept our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. Take them and use them to magnify and glorify God in this community and throughout the whole world. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Is that okay with you? Yeah. As we read this last section from the Gospel of Luke, as you're able, would you please stand out of respect for the reading of the Gospel? When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go down to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And you may be seated. I uh, always struggle a little bit what to call the, the message on Christmas Eve. It's really all about Jesus. And I remember some years that was just it. I just named it Jesus. But you know, sometimes just Jesus isn't enough. I, I, uh, I'm really aware that growing up in my life, I never didn't have Jesus, but I sure had some other troubles because I wasn't paying any attention to it. I wasn't following. I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't headed toward what Jesus wanted me to do. I was just saying, yeah, Jesus, you're over there, and I'm over here, and maybe you'll approve what I'm doing. Well, guess what? He got me through it, but I'm not sure he approved of it. So I looked at this, and I said, well, you know, it says here that this light developed in the sky, and the shepherds saw it. Now, it doesn't tell us that the shepherds were good Jews or good Methodists or good Baptists. They just said the shepherds saw it. I don't know if you know much about sheep, but sheep stink. Uh, I've had some sheep. They smell bad. And if you're a shepherd and you live with a sheep all the time, guess what? Probably smell like the sheep. And what this tells me is that when God brings us the message, He brings it for everybody. Not just for the people that know who Jesus is. Not just the people that went to Sunday school growing up. Not just the people that spent all their life trying to understand and read the Bible. He brings it for even those people that may have never heard one single word about Jesus. But they're out in the field tending their sheep and they see a light. And then they see the light. They acknowledge what the light is. The angels tell them all about it. And they follow through. But we also know, and we'll talk about it more as we get close to Epiphany, that the, the wise men saw it. The people from another country, from absolutely a different religion, saw it. So we know that that light is there for everybody. And one of the hardest things for me to deal with in today's world is that there's so many people that think some things are just for some of us. Some things are just for those of us that do it a certain way. 
And I got to tell you, you know, my struggle with church is that we got programs to plug in for everything. You need more attendance, you plug this in. You need more money, you plug this in. You do that, you plug this in. I think sometimes the church has missed the whole point. The point is, we're supposed to follow the star. We're supposed to follow Jesus. We're supposed to do the things Jesus calls us to. So in the recent days, I've been more and more aware of homelessness in our neighborhood around here. So we have a food box, and we're always grateful to receive donations to it. We put them in there. And it has a sign, and the sign provides directions in line with what I said today. It says, take what you need and leave what you can. And over the years that we've been doing it, since COVID started, my experience is that that's exactly what happens. People take stuff. Some people leave stuff. Of course, we here at the church donate to it, but in, in, in addition to that, people that we don't know or even see, I, I watch them, I'm in my office, they pull up there and they fill up the box. We got a thank you note a few weeks ago from a lady that said, thank you so much for not judging us. We don't have to jump through any hoops. We don't have to fill out any forms. We don't have to wonder what time it's open. We get here when we can, we get what we can, and we leave what we can. Well, it got cold the other day, did you notice? So I've been putting blankets and coats out there. And they've been going away pretty quick. I've also been finding people sleeping under the porticos here in the front of the church because it's warmer than it is out in the rest of the world. And there are times when we get annoyed with that because we're trying to do stuff and it's in the way. But you know when it's cold like this? Let them sleep. That's right. All I ask is they get out of the way when we need to come in and out of the church and clean up after themselves, which is a whole different issue some days. But I, I, I think what I've begun to realize is that the world is so uh, segmented. Used to, when I was a kid, it was segmented by race. You know, we had the, the, the black people and the Hispanic people and the white people. Although I never could understand all those colors, really. I'm not very white, and most of the African Americans I know aren't very black. But that's the names we used. But now it seems to be economics. It's not so much that we're separated by race, we're separated by economics. And I want to assure you that what I know is that even though times have been a little bit hard in the last few months, you know, gas prices have been high, diesel prices have even been higher, food prices have gone up, and it's been inconvenient, but it really hasn't changed my life. And my guess is it hasn't changed anybody in here's life much either. But what I do know is that if you're on the bubble, friends, if you don't have enough, those little things, when the price of milk doubles, you may not be able to have milk. When the price of eggs doubles, you may not be able to have eggs. And we live in a world right now where there are most of us that are doing fine, but there's a huge number of people that are not. And I don't know how we can come here today and talk, to, tell a story, reveal this story about this little boy that was born under extremely difficult circumstances, had to move immediately, well, even before he was born, to a different town, had to go to a place where, where Joseph hadn't made reservations, they had no room, and he lived, it was in a time when there was great angst in the world. The people were expecting a Messiah that would come on a horse with armor and an army and overturn Rome. And you know, some days I wake up and look at the news and it seems like that's what we're looking forward to. But Jesus came to us in a cradle or a stable or a feeding trough. It wasn't a beautiful place. Back to my sheep story, my sheep and cows, when they have a feeding trough, what I can assure you is wherever there's new feed for animals like that, there's also going to be manure. Jesus did not come into a lily white clean world with a lily white clean background with all of this great pedigree about how he was going to go out into the world and do the stuff he did, mostly he came poor. Mostly he didn't have much. But what he had was this innate ability to cross fences. He didn't get stuck on where he was supposed to be, whether, oh, it might not be okay to heal that guy because it's the Sabbath. He didn't get stuck on the fact that, well, don't really go to Samaria. Those people are not so good. But he went there and talked to a Samaritan woman. And because of that conversation, her whole village was saved. From time to time, I get people to ask me about God, and about salvation. So that seems to be a big thing with some people. Am I going to be saved? Am I saved? What have I had to do to get saved? Have I checked all the boxes? 
Well, I want to tell you, if you, have, if you have any questions about that, when you go home tonight, if you're not too sleepy, get out your Bible and open it to Matthew chapter 25, verses 34 and following. Now, four times in about 10 verses, the message from Jesus Christ is, if you're my follower, you're going to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the imprisoned, take care of the sick. Four times. When your mama told you something four times in about two sentences, was it important? Yeah. Yeah. Very. Okay. So I think this is important. What's not in there is go forward in front of the preacher and kneel down and say the sinner's prayer. What's not in there is that. What is in there is the people that do that will see eternal life. So sometimes we're pretty quick to judge folk, aren't we? Mm. We can decide, well, they haven't, they haven't checked all the boxes. Hey, they're not our boxes. It says in another place in the Bible, it says very clearly in the Gospels that any good work that happens is happening on behalf of Christ. And I think sometimes we need to spend some time right now in our lives looking more for the stuff that God's doing in the world than the stuff that people around us are not doing. Lots of good stuff is happening. There is a way more grace in this world than there is sin. And I know you're not going to hear it from the news. They can't make money selling news with good stories, except at Christmas. Where you're going to hear it is from your friends and the other people you talk to, or maybe from that person that you're standing out there by the food box and you make sure they get a coat. Or maybe from the people that got food when they didn't have it in any other place. Maybe from the people that get to see you handle stress and hurtfulness and anger in the world in a more positive way. Because following Jesus doesn't mean we won't suffer. I promise. Jesus suffered and we're going to suffer. Some days just suck. Yeah. They do? Yeah. That's a, that's a pregnant pause. I didn't forget what I was going to say. <laughs> Some days are just bad. And, and, you know, that doesn't mean God's gone anywhere. It doesn't mean God's abandoned us. It doesn't mean God's left us. Because if we believe that there's another side of this story, if we believe there's something more in the future, if we believe in the hope of the gospel, we know there's something more to come. What I think we miss so often is what our responsibility is in making that come in the community and in the world around us. One of these days, or whenever you got baptized, you know, he had all the authority that any preacher ever gets to preach the gospel. We get it from our baptism. We, we take on that public, visible way that we communicate the gospel. And you know, sometimes you can use words. And sometimes you can get out Bible verses and read them. But I'm convinced that more people look at who you are and what you do than what you say. Amen. I did some experiments that, about that when I was in my psychology class in college, and we stood out in front of the HEB store in San Marcos, Texas, and we were very polite to people with very ugly statements. And they all smiled and said hi and went on in. Nobody really hears your words like they see your affect, your attitude, and the way that you love others. Now I know that when you hear Jesus say, love others as you love yourself, some of us need to look in the mirror. I don't always eat well. I don't always take good care of myself. I don't always get enough sleep. But I'm a better faithful teacher and preacher of the gospel when I do. It's one of the reasons that God worked for six days and rested on the Sabbath. It's important for us to, to know who we are. And if we don't know who we are, then how in the world can we tell somebody else what it means for God? You need to know your own story. You need to be able to tell it. When I was in the sales business, we used to tell people, you need a five-minute elevator speech. You need, you, know, you need to tell somebody something about yourself that you can do while you're in an elevator. So you can't tell them the whole story. Oh, I was a sinner, and, and I came, you know, saw the light, and, and, and I changed my life, and it changed instantly because it almost never does. It changes gradually and over time. And one of these days, somebody that you knew a long time ago will look at you and say, wow, you're a lot different. Something's going on with you. You have a glow that you used to didn't have. I had people ask me when I was working in the secular world, where do you get that peace that gets you through the secular world pressure? You all know about that, right? When I was in the sales business, we had quotas. And, and if you didn't make a quota, you were not a good guy. And, and there was a constant pressure to make the quotas. I usually made mine, so I didn't have to deal with that pressure. 
But there were a lot of people that did. And you know what sometimes they needed? They needed somebody to say, hey, why don't you come go with me? Let me show you that it's not as hard as you think. It's not as bad as you think. Everybody won't say no. And I think that same thing is true when we talk about sharing the gospel with other people. Everybody that you talk to isn't going to jump up and down and say, oh, well, I'm going to be at church next Sunday. Actually, I have people tell me that, but they don't show up. I think what's more important is that I'm still here and that I, I, I become an anchor for y'all and y'all become an anchor for me. And together, we have a lot of that power that God gives more than any one person has. Jesus didn't go trying to do it alone. He had 12 disciples plus a lot of women. And they were working hard to go into communities. It was well known. People started to follow him. People were curious. They wanted to know. I don't think Zacchaeus, when he went and climbed up that sycamore tree, I don't think he was decided, I'm going to be saved today. I think he was curious about who Jesus was. Curiosity is a good thing. Kids have it. Lots of us grown-ups don't. Some of us get pretty cynical about it. And I think if we can remember that the signs, what are the signs? The sign is that God's grace abounds more than sin. The signs are that this story has been told for more than 2,000 years. The signs are that this story has been substantiated by historians. It's not just in this book. The signs are that I, I think, I think uh, oh gosh, I'm going to get his name wrong, so I'm not going to say it. A famous singer. Bono was who it was. They asked him, said, well, do you believe in Christ? He said, yes. He said, do you, do, you, do you pray to Christ? He said, well, yes. They seemed shocked. And they said, well, why? And he said, well, one reason is because the story's been told for 2,000 years. So Christ is either an idiot or the, or the Christ. And nobody has ever successfully followed an idiot for 2,000 years. I mean, there's some truth in that, isn't there? The story is real. It's been going on for a long time. People that our ancestors have been saved by the story. And it'll get us through the tough times. There is a star. I think it's clear outside tonight. I'm sure we can see one. What I'm always moved by is, you know, those stars are the same ones that people are seeing in West Texas right now. The same ones that people are seeing up north if it's not cloudy. Same ones people are seeing in Iraq and Ukraine and other places because God has set it up for us to be able to see the heavens, to know that there's something bigger and more powerful. There is something greater than us. Now, I know and believe with all my heart that that's Jesus Christ. Other people I know, they're not sure yet. But I don't think it's for me to judge that. It's just to keep loving them, to understand that all of us are on that journey. It's an undiscovered country from when we're born of it, we don't get to come back. But until we get there, we can do everything we can to be the person, to be the people that follow, to be the people of God that God has called us to be. So my prayer this year, uh, there's a song we sing sometimes, it's called Star Child. It's, uh, my prayer is this year is that Christmas comes for everyone. That Jesus coming again tonight, this morning, when we'll leave here in just a few minutes, that it is the thing that can absolutely change the world right now. I believe it. I'm going to live it. And I invite you to join me on the journey. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As AJ comes up, we're about to sing, O Come All Ye Faithful. Uh, you can remain seated while we sing.
in the United Methodist Church when we serve Holy Communion. We invite everyone in the room to come. We don't ask about church membership or your baptism. We only ask that you answer this invitation. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Let us together pray for the power and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. Together. God all power, grant that we may rid ourselves of the works of darkness. And that, and that we may invest ourselves with weapons of light in this life to which your Son, Jesus Christ, with great humility came to visit us, so that in the final day, when he returns in majestic glory to judge the living and the dead, we shall rise to eternal life through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. As we go through the great Thanksgiving, the words will be on the screen with the uh, eight, uh, uh, Leslie is going to play for us, but it will be during communion. And so uh, the great Thanksgiving ought to be next soon. So my part's in italics, your part is in dark, bold print. Hopefully you can see it well. Let us join together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right. And a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God. You are the creator of heaven and earth. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. In the fullness of time, you gave your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. And at his birth, the angels sang, Glory to you in the highest, and peace to your people on earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn together. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. As Mary and Joseph went from Galilee to Bethlehem, and there found no room, so Jesus went from Galilee to Jerusalem and was despised and rejected. As in the poverty of a stable Jesus was born, so by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. As your word became flesh, born of a woman, on that night long ago, so on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread. Giving it to his disciples, he said, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you and gave this to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. As we proclaim the mystery of our faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Amen. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son. Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. And the church said, Amen. 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 So the way we're serving communion nowadays is uh, we call it by intention. That's a fancy word. It simply means that I'm going to take a piece of bread, peel it off, and I'm going to dip it in the grape juice. You're going to come forward with your hands like this, and I'll hand it to you. 
we have prayer rails here. You're always welcome to come and pray. Uh, I don't, I'm not going to give any particular directions. Just come as you want to and as you feel like it and stay up as long as you'd like. Uh, the table is prepared. You want to come first? Come on. Let's leave the body and blood of Christ. The table is prepared. I would invite you now to come as you will. As Leslie plays for us my favorite Christmas song. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You'll just know. Come as you will.
Friends, we've been to the place yeah. where heaven and earth meet. We've only just begun to experience what God has to offer. Holly, are you going to pass out candles? Yeah, we'll bring them up and yeah. give them to them. We're, we're staying inside tonight. We're not going around where it's cold. already got them. <laughs> Holly's coming down the center. If you don't have a candle, everybody's going to need a candle. And while she's doing that, let's give Leslie a hand for that great solo that we just yeah. played. Everybody needs a candle. So here's the rules for candles. If you have a lit candle, it always stands straight up. If you have an unlit candle, you hold it this way until it's lit, and then you stand it straight up. That prevents wax from getting on you or anything else. And then the trustees aren't mad at me come Monday. So I'm going to go down the row with the, with the candle in the middle, and I'll light the person closest to the aisle, and y'all can light everybody else on the row. And then I will ease my way to the back and dim the lights. Or actually, I bet Romy would do that for me. You just slide those things down, Romy. Once we're all lit, and then we're going to sing Silent Night. So uh, let me get started. I get to have the big candle. Because I'm in charge. <laughs> you should have got a walk in there, Paul. Feel that confident. We got this first. Yes. Look at Lily, she follows the rules very good. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to come back up this way. Hey, do you think we can start this? As soon as we have the musician, we can just sing away.
walk around the door. And as you go, there's a basket in the back you can drop. You can take the candles with you. Some of them have been done pretty short. We won't be using them. So. Friends, it has been a great joy to be here tonight with you. To celebrate the birth of Christ. To join together as a community that cares. That's filled with grace and humility and love. It's really about four minutes till midnight. What do you think we just write it down that it's there? You okay with that? Amen. Yeah. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Go in peace. Merry